is uh, Dr. Terry Gerlach, a retired earth scientist who spent his career studying the gases and emissions from volcanoes all over the world. He was educated at the University of Wisconsin in Madison and completed a PhD in geology from the University of Arizona. Uh, in the year and a half since he and his wife retired here in, in Wapaka, He's spoken about his research at the universe, Large University Science Colloquium, the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh Geology Club, the UW Green Bay Natural and Applied Sciences Seminar Series, and the Neville Public Museum in Green Bay. Don't you think it's about time we have it, Winchester? Yeah. <laughs> Glad you're here. <laughs> sponsoring this uh, program. And uh, what I'll be talking about tonight is versus anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions. Okay, so what are this that big word anthropogenic? Uh, I hate to use that word, but there's, it's hard to find a good substitute for it. Anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions, CO2 emissions, are just simply the CO2 it's, it's the CO2 that's created by all of the activities of, of, of humanity. Uh, it involves the CO2 that's released from power plants, from exhaust pipes, anything that is, any CO2 that comes from the burning of fossil fuels. It involves the CO2 that's involved in uh, the CO2 that's involved in deforestation activity, <coughs> land use changes. Uh, cement making, when we make cement, there's an enormous amount of CO2 that's released from the limestone that's used to make cement, and so on. And of course, volcanic carbon dioxide or CO2 emissions simply refers to the CO2 that is released by volcanoes. And what I'm going to focus on in this talk is comparing the amounts of CO2 that comes from volcanoes with the amounts of CO2 that comes from basically our own activities. It's basically a comparison of volcanic CO2 pollution and our own pollution. And there's a quite a bit of interest in that these days as uh, people get more, more and more concerned about uh, the uh, amount of CO2 that we're putting into the atmosphere. One of the questions that frequently comes up, and it's the question that I'm asked more than any other uh, in general from the general public is, CO2 comes out of volcanoes, and how does it compare with the amount that we generate in our own daily activities, okay. and, and, uh, and our, our own uh, cultural activities? Um, now, let's see if this works. Ah, it does. Okay, this is a picture from Mount St. Helens in 1981, after, uh, shortly after the big eruption there. And I'm working here with Francois Lagern, who is a volcanic geochemist, was a volcanic geochemist uh, from uh, uh, the Center for National Research in Paris, France. And he was a person who was really obsessed. He unfortunately died just a few years ago, but he was very obsessed with the question of how much carbon dioxide comes out of volcanoes. And he particularly was interested in figuring out ways to monitor it so that we could use it as an indicator of volcanic unrest, as we call it, that pre tends to precede volcanic eruptions. And I was very interested in those same problems, and I got to work with him back in the 80s, and um, he, had, he could travel around a lot more than I did. He went to volcanoes all over the world, literally, and uh, we worked on the data together and we did some work in the field as well, like shown here at Mount St. Helens. And what we're actually trying to do here is to, uh, we're, these are the beginning days of trying to figure out some way of collecting the CO2 that's coming out of these gases. This is, this is the background here is the dome that developed uh, 
and the big hole that followed the big explosion the eruption at Mount St. Helens in the early 80s. And uh, what we're trying to do is capture the gases and then analyze them for, their comp for the composition to get the, the CO2 concentration or content of the gases. <laughs> now, why are we so, why were we so interested in CO2? Well, there's two basic reasons. First of all, in the 70s, there was a lot of research done in laboratories that actually study magma or molten rock. There are laboratories that are actually dedicated to that in a few places in the world. And one of the things that, they've always, that they were interested in was determining how much of the various kinds of gases are dissolved, could dissolve in this magma before it came up to the surface. And most of the work had been done simply on water. And water is extremely soluble in magma. So I mean, you can put six weight percent of, of water into silicate melts, silicate uh, uh, molten rock very easily under pressure. So then they started working with carbon dioxide, and then they started working with sulfur and with HCl and a number of other gases. But the interesting thing was that all of them were quite soluble except for carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide had a very low solubility. And so this made it potentially, we thought, a very good um, alerting gas for the rise of magma from depth up into the magma chamber under a volcano because as because it was had such a low solubility because it didn't tend to dissolve easily in the magma it would come out sooner it would come out earlier in this rise from depth and we might be able to uh, detect it by doing analyses of gases at funeral samples in places uh, of the sort shown here. Now, uh, the other reason that was really an important uh, gas for us to consider was all these other gases that, that, are, that are soluble in magma and that come out are also very soluble in water. And volcanoes in a lot of places, particularly in the Cascades and in the Aleutians, are full of water. And because of that, it's possible that gases could come out of magma as it, in, as it intrudes into or, or you know, uh, invades a volcano, give off lots of gas, and yet you might not see much simply because the gas gets dissolved in the water in the volcano. CO2 is not particularly soluble in, wa in water. And so those are the two reasons that we were really obsessed with trying to figure out how to <coughs> measure the concentration of this gas, but also measure the actual emission rate of a gas like CO2 from a volcano. How many tons per day come out? We want to get the flux. That's hard to do. That's very, very hard to do with carbon dioxide compared to most of the other gases we could use because there's this background CO2 in the atmosphere. And so what you're out there trying to do is measure a little tiny one to three or four or five ppm peak on top of a huge amount of of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which, which in those days, when this was, in these days, was running at around 340 or 50 parts per million. So those were the, um, those were the um, challenges then to what, what we were trying to do. Okay, we did this in a number of places and we began to have some success. And as a result of that, um, the survey, I, at this point, I'm working for an engineering lab in Albuquerque called Sandia National Laboratories, and was working in, on advanced geothermal activities and so on, and I would go to volcanoes to do things for the geothermal project. But um, this was, this was my, my, own, my main research interest, and um, the survey really liked what we were doing, and this based the U.S. Geos Geological Survey, and so that's led to my getting a job with the survey and doing this then as a, uh, a professional uh, USGS geologist, and I was the leader of their gas, uh, their gas emissions program. It's a very small group of people, only about five or six people at any time, and I was the leader of that for a good 15 years or so. And I continue to work with the survey uh, until I retired after another 20 years. So anyway, um, when I worked for the survey, they had a, an outreach program that started in the 80s, early 80s, 
that was called Ask a Geologist, and it still exists. And this is a place where people can go by, by email nowadays and ask questions, geological questions about <coughs> things that uh, they want to know about. And the, the people who read your email will send these questions off to people within the U.S. Geological Survey who they think are best uh, likely to be able to answer them. And one of the questions that they got persistently and that they got very frequently, even back in the 80s, it was already beginning to be of interest, was how does, how does the CO2 um, do volcanoes put out as much CO2 as we do? Basically, that's the question that people were really um, giving them a lot. And there weren't very many people in the survey that wanted to deal with that because geologi geologists want to talk about rocks and deal with you know, things like that, rocks and water and so on. Uh, they don't really have much, um, in general, they don't have all that much interest or background in what, what kind of gases come out of volcanoes. So when I joined the survey, that became my job too. I was the guy that they went to with these questions. And I got so I got, I got asked this question more than any question I was ever asked uh, in my entire career. And I got this question from the general public, from students, from educators, from policy makers who were interested in want, wanting to know how much CO2 came out of volcanoes with respect to what would be, you know, the proper kind of climate policy or energy policy. And I got questions from media people, um, writers, you name it. And, and also a lot of geologists who were not volcanologists. And when I was starting out, there wasn't really a whole lot that I could say to answer this question in terms of giving them actual data on how much CO2 comes out of, and then we're talking now globally for the whole Earth, how much, what, what's a good estimate for how much CO2 comes out of the, out of the volcanoes and how, did, how would it compare with, uh, with what we're putting out of power plants and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, I, what I fell back on was a study, studies that were done by, uh, studies of the carbon cycle. We used to call it the carbon cycle, nowadays they call it the carbon biogeochemical cycle. And these are studies that are done by geochemists. And pretty much their studies go on in this surface environment, the ocean, the air, the soils, the, and, and the biosphere. And you can trace carbon. You can, you can trace the movement of carbon from all these, from these various reservoirs back and forth. CO2 comes out of the air. It's taken in by a plant through photosynthesis. It becomes part of the plant, and the plant might be eaten by an animal and becomes part of the animal. And, uh, it dies and the CO2 goes back into the air and so on and so forth. You can do these kinds of, uh, these kinds of um, uh, pathways for uh, geochemical pathways for the ocean and for the atmosphere and the soils. But they're all pretty much a, a, a um, zero-sum game. In other words, the, the CO2 really doesn't get destroyed. It just keeps going around and around and around here. And these are sometimes really huge fluxes. when the when the, like soon when we see the uh, leaves start growing out of trees, there's an enormous amount of CO2 that's being transferred from the atmosphere to the trees. I mean, you're talking about trillions of tons of CO2, and then when they die every fall, there's trillions of tons that go back. Well, those are fluxes that are much huger than the amounts of either volcanic <laughs> CO2 or anthropogenic CO2. But interesting, but, but, they're all, but, they're, but it's a zero-sum game, so there's really no net gain or net loss in most of that. But there is a little, tiny amount of leakage from the fact that limestones form over time. So CO2 can react with water in the atmosphere and make carbonic acid, that's what this stuff is here, and then it comes out in rainwater, so rainwater is really uh, fairly acid, has a pH of about 4. And it's, uh, it, it, it weathers the rocks, it breaks down the rocks, it makes soil. And in that process, it releases a lot of ions, including calcium, that ultimately gets transported to the ocean, where they can react with uh, bicarbonate and actually produce limestone deposits of calcium carbonate. That's what this stuff is here. And that stuff 
then falls down to the bottom of the ocean, uh, and it gets attached to what we might call the oceanic crust, or the crust of the Earth, or the lithosphere. And when that, at that point, that CO2 is really then sort of locked in for a long, long, long time. You, uh, when, when you get attached to the lithosphere here, you know, you may, from these spreading centers in the ocean over millions of years, get transported down a subduction zone and deep into the Earth. And so once, once you put that, once you end up uh, being attached to this solid part of the Earth, you're there for a long, long time. And these people, these geochemists worked out, they calculated, they said, okay, let's, you know, let's try to figure out how much of that stuff is actually lost. And, and they were able to do that. And they came up with a figure, it's given here, the rate of CO2 lost in the crust is about, is roughly 0.3 billion metric tons per year. That's their preferred estimate. And an overall range of somewhere in this range right here, 0.1, say to 0.4 but figure about 0.3 billion tons of CO2 is lost every year uh, by this process of limestone formation. And these are metric tons. Now metric tons are, I don't know, most, most Americans you know, think in terms of the American ton or the, the so-called short ton, which is just 2,000 pounds. These metric tons that the scientists use are just 10% 10 10 bigger. They're just, it's like 2,205 pounds to be precise. But if you're thinking as a ton as being 2,000 pounds, that's close enough. So when I say a ton, I mean a metric ton. But if you want to just, whatever, you, whatever image you get when I say a ton, just try to increase it by 10% and you'll, you'll be fine. Okay, um, so this amount of CO2 is lost. Well, okay, why, so what, so what? Well, it turns out that if this goes on for 10,000 years, that's enough to completely deplete all the CO2 in the atmosphere. And that's going to have an enormous effect on climate because it's going to make things very cold. Or if it goes on for 100,000 years, it's going to deplete all the CO2 in the atmosphere, and plus clean out most of the CO2 in the ocean as well. And yet, when you look at the geologic record, when you study rocks of different ages and limestones and so on and so forth, and, 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 and um, see what kinds of changes have actually occurred, there is no evidence that that much that that, that you know that, that those those things ever happen. The atmosphere doesn't really lose all of its CO2, even though this process is going on. So they reasoned then that okay, something has to be resupplying it. And so, what do you think that is? Well, it's these volcanoes. It's mainly these volcanoes, and then there's a little bit that's resupplied through this process of metamorphism. When limestones get actually pulled down inside the earth and they get heated up, they will sometimes give, they can give back some of their CO2. But they suspect that, they suspect that, that uh, you know, most of this return is through volcanoes. So this is an interesting perspective that even volcanolog very few volcanologists have this perspective, quite frankly, to realize that you know the role of volcanoes is in part to, is a resupply. It's a, it's a rebalancing and a resupply agent for all the CO2 that's lost by this weathering and limestone production. And if it didn't do that, things would be very cold. On the other hand, if it overdoes it, things can get very warm. So that was the best estimate that I could come up with for people was about 0.3 billion tons but that's an upper estimate because part of that is metamorphic CO2 and subsequent work in order to show that about 80% uh, of this amount uh, comes back in the form of, um, of metamorphic, I mean, uh, volcanic CO2 and then there's about 20% only that's metamorphic. So this, this number then is a pretty good upper estimate for uh, the amount of CO2 that's, that's uh, got to be coming back into this system at, every year. So um, that was the number that I gave people in those days, and I said that uh, we don't actually have direct measurements of CO2 <coughs> from volcanoes yet, but we're getting there. And <clears throat> not too long after this, then we began to produce that kind of information. But <clears throat> That's the volcanic part, as best I could answer it in those days. The 
anthropogenic or human part that goes with it back in those days was also huge. It was on the order of 20 to 30 billion tons, much, much bigger than this right here. And in fact, today, humanity's, the 2013 CO2 emissions uh, for 2013, uh, this is provided by the Global Carbon Project, which is a huge you know, international organization that gathers data from all over the place to put these numbers together. Uh, most of their basic data actually nowadays comes from British Petroleum. British Petroleum has really opened up and provided uh, all of their information on, on production figures uh, for, for the whole, uh, basically for the whole oil industry and, and also for a lot of coal and gas and all, all, all forms of hydrocarbons. And so that's the basic data that, that you start with in producing this number here. And this is a number for 2013, and it's currently growing at a rate of about 2.5% a year. The number for 14 is going to be up another billion tons and they're working on the 2014 estimate right now. And they estimate their uncertainty and this is like plus or minus 5%. So, you've got 0.3 billion tons coming up from volcanoes, let's say, as a maximum, and you've got this amount being produced by humanity. So that's a factor of a hundred difference. So the, 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 back in the old days, back in these days, you know, it looked like humanity's uh, CO2 production uh, was roughly 100 times what volcanic uh, CO2 production is. And that still holds up to be a pretty good estimate. So that's pretty much the answer there. Uh, and um, what uh, I'd just like to show you is give you some feel for um, how much CO2 that is. If you take 39.4 billion tons of CO2 and you make dry ice out of it, you get 6.3 cubic miles of dry ice per year. <laughs> so imagine a rectangle. Imagine a really big rectangle that stretches from, say, the outer, uh, just the outer limits of Wapaka all the way to the outer limits of Wyoming. That's about 6.3 miles. And imagine that rectangle is a mile wide and a mile high. You fill that box every year just with the amount of CO2 that <clears throat> humans put into the atmosphere every year. Now that's enough, that's enough CO2 to fill, <coughs> oops, I keep doing that. That's enough CO2 to fill Lake Erie in 18 years. And if you include the fact that it's growing at the rate of 2.5% per year, you can fill Lake Erie in 15 years. Okay, so... That's what we were doing back in the back in the when I first you know really got into this in my career in the early 80s. In the 90s, the people who were running the climate change programs and, and that kind of thing, the, the, what we call climate change programs today, they called them in those days they called them global change programs. And they came to the survey and they also came to a lot of university people and they said, look, you know this. This, we'd like to this estimate of 0.3 CO, uh, billion tons of CO2 for volcanoes as an upper limit, but we'd really like you to quantify it. We'd really like you to measure it, so just so we can be sure. Because they were interested in tying down the fluxes and the values in addition to having you know, all of humanity's CO2 output. They really wanted to tie it on all the natural background fluxes as well. So we set about uh, to do that. And um, um, we reached the point uh, during the 90s of being able to actually produce numbers for these CO2 emissions that, that, that we actually, actually measured. And I'm going to just show you uh, kind of a summary of those results here pretty quick. So <coughs> looking at volcanoes then the, where the CO2 can come from, there are subaerial and submarine volcanoes. Subaerial volcanoes are simply volcanoes that emit gas into the air. Submarine volcanoes emit gas into the sea. And um, so that's two kinds of volcanoes we have to deal with. And there are basically three plate tectonic settings where, there, where these kind of, where, where volcanoes um, are active and where we get lava production and, and uh, explosive uh, ash production and that sort of thing. The biggest one is are the spreading centers, particularly under the ocean, like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge system if you've seen pictures of that. 
the, the ocean spreading center, and there's also some rift zones on continents that are part of that uh, spreading as well. But th these are these are rift zones where the plates are divergent. The plates are spreading away from each other. So these are so-called divergent plate boundaries. And this big system of, of, of volcanoes under the ocean is actually the biggest mountain chain on the Earth. It's about 40,000 miles uh, long. And the other big system, uh, and that, by the way, produces 75% of all the lava, all the, all the magma that's erupted every year. The other big system is the, convection, the co convergence zones. These are the places where the plates are coming together, the convergence zones. And they're frequently on coastal areas where the seafloor is being subducted down underneath the continent. And they can also form in island arcs where again the seafloor is going down under uh, uh, what is kind of a, 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 a substratum of, of a continental area. And these, these volcanoes are called subduction zone volcanoes. This is what the Mount St. Helens types of volcanoes are made out of. These tend to be extremely explosive. Uh, and uh, they have gas, they have lots of gas in them. So they, these are magnets that are rich in silica, they're viscous, and they're full of gas, and that tends to make them very explosive. So the convergent plate volcanoes then is, in, is a second class of volcanoes that had to be measured up. And they produce about 15% of all the volcanism or all the, all the lava production every year. Right here, down here, I'm showing you the global volcanic magma production. Every year it amounts to about one cubic mile. So uh, the remainder is produced, uh, the remaining 10% uh, comes from these so-called hotspot volcanoes. These are places where plumes, we call them plumes, come up from the mantle very deep and actually punch right through the plates and form uh, a, a, a volcano. Uh, an example of this is Kilauea Volcano. All of the Hawaiian Islands are produced this way. That's, that's their origin. And they also can come up underneath continents. And when they do, they produce things like Yellowstone. Yellowstone is an example of that. So we have three, two, three plate tectonic environments then. In one, the plates are being spread apart. And there's going to be volcanoes and, and gas production from those. And the other places where the plates come together, that produces Magma is some of it shown here, which can come up into these cascade-type volcanoes and reproduce explosions and eruptions and gas releases. And then the Hawaiian types, which are on the, the, the uh, hot spots, these are often referred to as intraplate, because intraplate, because they actually come right through a plate uh, and build a volcano then on top of the plate. So, we measured up things then for these three, and this was a kind of an international effort. We measured this stuff up uh, for these three environments, and <coughs> subaerial and submarine. And <coughs> over the period of the 90s, and these are the reports you know that we that we put together. And uh, as you can see, this pretty well covers the 90s. And uh, these are the estimates. These are this is the CO2 emissions here in billions of tons per year, and uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, the bars, the, the, well, the dots are the preferred values of various authors, and the, and the bars are estimated uh, uncertainty or estimated range that, that, they, that they consider to be reasonable. And um, over time, this is the way it's stacked up. And the uncertainties all pretty much overlap in these studies. So, um, uh, that's a good thing. There isn't somebody way off over here or way off over here. These things tend to agree uh, pretty well with a value. If you take the mean value of all these preferred estimates, you get a value that's about 0.2, more or less about 0.2 uh, billion tons per year. And if you take that line and go plus or minus 0.2, 0 0.5 or 25 percent, that is, on either side of that value of 0.2, you include all of these preferred values pretty much or pretty close to, close to falling in, into that. And uh, in terms of uh, 
in terms of where these gases are coming from, in terms of those uh, tectonic environments, uh, it works out about like this. About 40% of all this CO2 comes from the divergent plates, where the plates are separating. Most of that's coming out under the ocean. And about 40% comes from the, where the plates are converging and smashing into each other, the subduction zone volcanism. And then the remaining 20% comes from the Yellowstones and the Hawaii's, the intraplate volcanoes. And if we compare this, you know, it's nice, you know, it's it's nice to have all of these uncertainty intervals and see how, you know, what the total range of things could be and see how the different groups vary. This builds confidence. This is the kind of thing people like in science. And when they, when they talk about having confidence and being having a lot of confidence in the results, it's what they can do and they can put up data that's of this sort. Now, the other thing in science that's really important is consistency. And consistency is, in a way, really even more powerful than confidence because if you can do this problem by a completely, with a completely different data set, using totally different techniques, and get basically the same result, that's a consistency. That's consistency. And that's powerful. Well, this, these are all the results for the people, the geochemists, that were inferring how much CO2 had to be coming out based on their carbon rebalancing of the CO2 in the atmosphere that I showed you earlier. A value of 0.31. This includes not only volcanic CO2, but a little bit of metamorphic CO2 as well. And you can see they fit, it fits pretty well. Most of these points are just a little bit less than this. And um, if you consider that about 80% of this value is volcanic, that gives you a point right in here which kind of agrees with, with, with this spread. So <clears throat> this was uh, considered to be, OK, you've got it. It's nailed down. What you measure here is basically the same thing these people were telling us. And they were satisfied with that. And they stopped funding us. So we know after that point, we, were, we, were, we went back to getting. And by the way, those, those of you who are uh, paying taxes to support this research during this time, I, I thank you very much. I acknowledge that, and I appreciate it. We would have never been able to develop these techniques to develop uh, uh, better measurements of carbon dioxide emissions on volcanoes, which we can now go back and use for hazard studies for, for working with volcano hazards problems because we have you know developed that for this for this particular program here and uh, starting uh, you know after the 90s we went back to all the USGS work was then funded by the volcano hazards program again now there were no more studies done until just last year there was one study done by this group here, and they tried to maximize everything just to see how big a result they could get from volcanoes if they, if they really were, you know, sort of, well, they did a lot of things I didn't like, but uh, they would do things like, when we did this study, when we did these studies here, we used the actual number of active volcanoes that you have on the face of the earth every year. Every year on the face of the Earth, there's about 70 to 80 active volcanoes. That's the kind of assumption that we used when we did these studies. These guys said, well, we're going to give them, we're going to, you know, let dormant volcanoes put out a little bit of CO2 also. And so they actually considered that uh, 500 rather than 70 or 80 volcanoes were, were degassing. And they, they, were, they, they didn't really know how much a dormant volcano could be gas, but they made some intelligent guesses, so they thought. And so that's one of the reasons this number is so much larger. It's kind of like giving voting rights to the dead in a way. And I have never, I have, I have, I have, I have been waiting for somebody to really criticize this. Also notice no uncertainty interval or anything. So I don't really, I'm pretty skeptical about this point. But I like to use it nevertheless because it's clearly an upper limit. And it also doesn't agree with this, by the way. It's clearly an upper limit. And if you think about where anthropogenic or human CO2 production fits on this plot, it's going to plot way over there, somewhere on the other side of the building. And so this tells you clearly that we are significantly different than any kind of uh, 
uh, CO2 or CO2 production from mankind. All right. Um, if we then put this into perspective with anthropogenic CO2 pollution, I'm going to use the value of 0.26. This was the highest value that we got in the 90s. I'm going to use that one. And here is humanity's 39.4 total for comparison. Now what I'm going to do is break this down into its components. The first, the biggest, is fossil fuel combustion. And that's like 46, that's 33.9, and that's 46% from coal burning, 35% from oil burning, and 19% from gas burning. And so you can see that still that way over, uh, it's way down into volcanic. The next big thing, what do you think it would be? <coughs> what? Yes. Wood. Well, the next big thing are land use changes, which is based primarily deforestation. And that goes down to 3.3. So, but this still is much larger than volcanoes. That's 13 times larger than what comes out of volcanoes. And the next one down is cement making. Uh, here's the reaction involved in cement making. You just heat limestone until it breaks down to calcium oxide and CO2. And so there's, there's a certain amount of CO2 that's released from this reaction. And that amount is two, uh, two billion tons for all, for all of humanity. That's the global, that's the global cement production CO2 uh, contribution. And that, as you can see, is also significantly larger than the volcanic thing. And then finally, we get down to one that is very similar to volcanoes, and that's ga this is gas flaring of all the wells in the world. The wells in the world produce a lot of methane and things like that, which, and in fact, we're beginning to realize in the last year that they don't do a good job of gas flaring, and this number is going to grow some because they need to do a much better job. But anyway, the gas flaring produces CO2 by burning the methane, and that um, number is more or less in the ballpark. Of volcanoes, and if I if I do this plot for uh, the study that got you know much much higher off off the chart kind of you know, value for volcanoes, you see it really still doesn't make much difference. So it's pretty clear that uh, anthropogenic CO2 is just way down over volcanic CO2. Now this shows how this evolves through time. This here I've plotted just simply straight lines for volcanic CO2 emissions. And the yellow one is the off-the-chart one, and the red one is the one that I would say is probably the best estimate. It's the one I've been using with 0.26 billion tons per year. So starting in 1900, this, this data for this, by the way, goes all the way back to the Industrial Revolution back in 1730. But this is, this is really kind of an interesting part. Starting in 1900, we're about 5 billion tons, and we go all the way up to about 1950 here before we get to 10. So we took the 50, first 50 years, we doubled it. Then we go all the way up to about 2,000, and we're at 30. So we go from 10 up to 30 in the next 50 years. That triples it. That's a tripling. And now we have a kink, and we're accelerating up here. And what do you think this is due to? Well, this is because everybody else is trying to live now the same way we do. And this is basically the coming online of China and India. And this has accelerated the CO2 production, uh, as you can see here. It's getting steeper. Now, there's a little glitch right in here. What do you think that is? That's the Great Recession that we just lived through. That's what happened there. So all these little ups and downs in here pretty much reflect economic activities and or, or world war, uh, the world wars. Um, this weird point right here, this was a year when there was just incredible burning of forests in Brazil and the Amazon forest jungle. And there was so much outcry from the world that they got that fortunately under control and brought that back down. So, but for one year it was just incredibly high. Um, and that's why that's an anomalous point there. So you can see then that as time goes on, um, 
the anthropogenic CO2 actually increases relative to volcanic CO2 and by a, you know, an accelerating amount. So that's, um, <coughs> that's what we were busy doing in the 90s, was, was you know, really tying all this down. Um, and ironically, at the same time, there were messages like this, messages that I call the claim, which became rampant on the internet, and they were very common also. They started showing up in the popular press. They're on a lot of talk radio programs. <coughs> And people's claiming that volcanoes emit far more carbon dioxide than is released by human activities. And this, this is, if you go on the internet, this is all over the place. And <coughs> this is uh, uh, an assertion that is made by people, and I've never ever once seen an explanation for it, or I've never seen any, I've never seen any supporting evidence for this whatsoever. It's just made as though this is a, a scientific fact. There is, there, it's never presented as, say, um, a hypothesis to investigate or as a, as a proposition to discuss. It, they never provide any supporting evidence. It's just simply stated uh, in this fashion. And quite frequently, it's in uh, connection with uh, <coughs> discussions about why should we regulate our CO2 mm -hmm. emissions if volcanoes are emitting mm -hmm. far more carbon dioxide than is released by human activities. And the chief proponent of this um, claim, as I call it, is Ian Plymer. And Ian Plymer um, is a, well, he's a, he's a mining geologist at the University of Adelaide in Australia. He owns a mining company, and he's on the board of directors of the biggest coal company in the world, or the biggest coal company in Australia. It's a huge thing. And uh, he has written a book called Heaven and Earth, Global Warming, the Missing Science. And it's a debunking of global warming. And in his book, there are about five places where he makes statements similar to this, that volcanoes add far more carbon dioxide to the oceans and atmosphere than humans. And again, typical of people of the claim, that make this claim, he provides no, no uh, supporting evidence. He gives no numbers. He doesn't refer to any kind of studies that have ever been done. It's all just, uh, well, these things, Fall, these things tend to fall at the end of paragraphs just as, as statements. And uh, the, uh, the book has all kinds of references to uh, volcano uh, studies and so on. They reference my paper that uh, I did for uh, volcanic, uh, global volcanic CO2. He references papers, other, others of those, uh, those studies that I, papers of those studies that I showed you, but he never gives the, he never gives the results. The results are never presented. And so I think that's the missing science actually. But, <laughs> but at any rate, um, at any rate this, is, uh, this, is, this is a book that has had an enormous impact on a lot of the general public. This was the third best selling in, in 2009 when I first came across this. I came across this thing in December of 2009 when I was at uh, American Geophysical Union meeting. And this, this book uh, in 2009 and 2010 was, was uh, ranked uh, the number three best selling book on Amazon for climate science. Mm -hmm. And um, so I decided at that point that I was going to write some papers and challenge all this stuff. And uh, because it's just not true. And so I had written uh, a paper that was published that's a critique, basically, of this, just a one-page critique. Uh, I don't critique the whole book, but just this volcano nonsense, this volcano CO2 nonsense that he has there. And that is in the uh, uh, magazine called Earth, which you can buy at Barnes & Noble off the rack. And I uh, published a, a commentary in there in the year 2010, uh, taking apart a lot of the things that he says. And that thing became so popular that they put it on their website and just give it away, gave it away to people. And if you want a copy of it, I brought some along. <laughs> or if you want to just give me your name, your email address, I'll send you a copy of it. I also then wrote a, a three-pager for mainly for science teachers, high school teachers and college student, college teachers, to, that really just laid out this whole thing kind of the way I had for you here, only a little bit more detail on the geology 
and um, just so that they have something that they you know could refer to because you know students ask you about things like this and um, because they hear about it I mean they're on the internet you know and the internet is just full of this and so um, uh, I also have some copies of that up here and I'll be willing to just uh, you know send you uh, PDFs if you don't want to take the paper copy but um, uh, that has kind of quieted this thing down. This guy has never made any reply to anything that I've written. And, uh, well, I don't want to spend any more time on it. But um, I want to just say, okay, how much volcanism do we have to have in order for volcanic CO2 to be as great as what, you know, we're, what we're producing anthropogenic? <laughs> How much volcanism would that require in order for volcanoes to put out as much CO2 as we need? And what it requires is it requires super eruptions. Super eruptions come in two, form, two forms. Uh, effusive super eruptions, which are just long, fantastic outpourings of lava that go on for thousands and thousands of years. And uh, these, are called, these are called continental flood basalts. They happen about every 30 million years, 20 to 30 million years. And they produce, they're, they're basically the plumes, the plumes coming up from the mantle, like at Hawaii, but then the head of the plume just pours out on the surface and you have these gigantic slugs of magma discharging for thousands of years before it bleed, bleeds off the whole head of the plume. And these things put out enormous amounts of magma. Uh, they usually go on for about a million years, but uh, they don't go constantly. They, they'll go for several thousand years and then shut off for a little while and then go for another few thousand years and so on. But in total, that time that they're active is about a million years. And they um, produce, this is the Deccan, the Deccan continental flood basalts which cover this whole red area here in India. Most of this thing is like around the order of about two miles thick. And this thing is pretty typical of them in size. This thing has produced what turns out to be uh, about 260,000 cubic miles of magma. That's enough magma to cover the United States from coast to coast and from north to south border and 350 feet of lava. Now, a colleague of mine, Steve Self, has worked on these Deccan, he's the expert on the Deccan flood basalts, he's a volcanologist, and he made an estimate of how much CO2 emission they produce each year when they're operating and when they're active. In other words, when they're flowing out over the surface. And, uh, he comes up with 2 billion tons of CO2 per year. Well, now we're per currently producing 40. So that means we're producing the equivalent of 20 of these kinds of eruptions going on. And I actually have worked that the, the kinds of, of basalt, the kinds of magma that's involved here is very, is very similar to the magma that <coughs> in Hawaii. It's the same kind of stuff. It's these plume basalts. And I've worked on those, and I have actually determined how much CO2 they have in them. And my number is twice the number he used here. He used a smaller number, but he was trying to be conservative. So I think, this, I think a better number is twice the amount of CO2 that's in here. So I would say that these things produce annually about 4 billion tons per year. I think that's more likely. And that would mean, then, that we're, that we're producing CO2 at the equivalent of about 10 of these. I think that's more realistic, about 10 of these going on simultaneously, imagine that, at once. So that's one way then to come up with something that you can compare with our CO2 production, something in volcanology that you can compare with our, with our CO2 production. And uh, it's, an awful, it's, a, it's an awful lot of CO2. Now, these things are really interesting, these Deccan uh, flood basalts, because it turns out there have been five mass extinctions on the planet Earth during geologic time, five of 
and four of them correlate with these flood basalts. Four, there, four of them, there's, there, every one of them, all four of them are correlated with flood basalts. The Deccan flood basalts were thought, the fifth, the fifth extinction, which was, which was the extinction of the dinosaurs, was thought to be related to these things because they were sort of the same age, but they could never debate, debate these precisely enough. And people could always argue, well, they were, these flows were too early, for the demise of the dinosaurs, or they were after. They never could present, get really precise uh, values. And then came along this, this theory that the, that the dinosaurs were killed by, by the big meteorite impact. And that has been uh, the explanation for the fifth extinction until about two months ago. There was a paper that came out in Science where they now have very precise dates for these things. They keep working on improving the precision of these dating techniques. And they have now shown to everybody's satisfaction that these things did form at the same time as the dinosaurs disappeared. They, they, they started to form about 200,000 years before the dinosaurs' extinction and they continued for uh, about 500,000 years after the dinosaurs' extinction. So they now think that these things probably played a role in the distinction of the dinosaurs and maybe added to what the meteorite impact did, or maybe they were responsible for all of it, or whatever. But anyway, this is, because, this is a real hot topic. And if you watch public television and watch NOVA and things like that, I can guarantee that over the next year or two, we're going to see programs about that. Now, there's another class of eruptions that are super eruptions, and these are the this is the explosive variety. Uh, <clears throat> these are really big eruptions. These happen about once every hundred thousand years. The last one occurred seventy four thousand years ago, right here. And this is Lake Toba, and this is in Sumatra, Indonesia, and. Uh, this eruption was really large. These super eruptions, uh, super explosive eruptions, will put out at least 110 uh, cubic miles of rock in just a matter of hours. They just blow it right out of the earth. And this one actually put out 670 cubic miles of rock in a time period like that. And it occurred 74,000 years ago, which is fairly close to when the last ice age started. And a lot of people like to claim that, a lot of people will argue that this actually triggered that ice age. I don't believe that, but, but that's, that, that's an interesting thing that uh, goes on about this. Um, they are, in Indonesia and on Sumatra, they're just 2.5 degrees north of the equator. They're very close to the equator. Eruptions in Indonesia have enormous climate effects because being close to the equator, the gases get not only into their, they get into both hemispheres. And so you get global climate effects from eruptions in Indonesia, largely because of that. Now the global climate effect of eruptions is mainly to cool the earth. And it's coming from all of the sulfur dioxide that's in these magmas. The sulfur dioxide in these magmas gets oxidized and reacts with water in the stratosphere to form sulfuric acid aerosols. And those aerosols, those sulfate aerosols, are very shiny and they reflect sunlight. And as a result of that, there is a cooling of the earth that occurs if this volcano that's responsible is close enough to the equator so that that big gas plume in the stratosphere can get into both, both, uh, both hemispheres, which this one obviously did. And this eruption almost wiped out the human race. There's a lot of, go home and uh, look at Wikipedia or Google, Google Lake Toba uh, uh, population bottleneck or genetic bottleneck. This, this, this eruption, uh, uh, actually killed so many people, they think, that um, you know, they were beginning to 
get to be too sparse and lose genetic diversity and, and, and they're almost uh, you know, became extinct. Now, I don't necessarily believe that, but there, 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 there's some really, if you want to read some, some interesting reading related to this explosive eruption, that's, uh, that's one to look into. This is a, this is a really, uh, really big um, eruption. So this distance, for instance, in this, what, this hole in the ground becomes filled with hot rock from underneath. It just wells up into it. It's plastic and it can move up into it and it forms what we call a resurgent dome inside this caldera and then of course it fills up with the lake. The surface part uh, around the, the dome fills up with water. This distance here from here to here is 52 miles. And from here to here is 20 miles. Now that's the size of this thing. Here are some examples of these things. Super eruptions are defined as being 110 cubic miles of magma that's shot into the air in these explosive paroxysms in a matter of a few hours or a few days. Yellowstone, 590 cubic miles. That's a little smaller than the Topa eruption. So that was one, and that was 2.1 million years ago. <coughs> Yellow, there's another Yellowstone, but it's only 63, 65 million miles, so it wasn't quite a super eruption. Here's one Long Valley caldera in California, and some of you are probably familiar with that. That was a super eruption. And then Yellowstone again, 0.64 million years ago, that was a super eruption. Then we come up here to the 19th century, uh, Tambora, the biggest eruption in recorded history but only 12 cubic miles. That was not a super eruption. Cracked Tau, that's one of its famous uh, uh, 2.4 cubic miles. Uh, Katmai, this is a once in a hundred year type eruption. Katmai in Alaska, a once in, a, in the early 19, 1912, that was a once in a hundred year eruption. In 1991, Pinatubo, I worked on that one, that was a one in a hundred year eruption. And then here's a little old Mount St. Helens, just a tenth of a cubic mile. So that gives you kind of a, 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 a comparison of what these super eruptions are compared to these sort of like normal or critical eruptions. Now what I've done is I, I know from my work on Mount St. Helens and from Pinatubo, I worked on both of those eruptions, I know how much magma came out given here, but I also know how much CO2 came out. So I know how much CO2 is in those magnets. So I can take this magma, say, from Mount St. Helens or from Mount Pinatubo, and I can scale it up to this value here. I can go from this tenth of a cubic miles. I can just scale that up to that number right there, and then correspondingly figure out how much CO2 that would involve when it explodes, when it erupts. And the same thing for Pinatubo. I can do that. And this number is, of course, just barely a super eruption, so I call this an economy-sized super <laughs> eruption, explosive super eruption. And when I do that, I, uh, I find out that when we get uh, magmas that, uh, uh, you know, are just barely uh, super eruption, uh, they, they give off about 10 billion tons of CO2. That's what they, that's what they, that's what my results are for this, doing this with Mount St. Helens and Pinatubo. So in other words, if we go back to this plot here, here's our anthropogenic curve. If we go back then to 10 billion tons of CO2 and come over here and say, okay, when was that? Well, that was in 1950. So in 1950, we crossed into super explosive eruption CO2 releases of 10 billion tons of CO2. Now we're doing like around 40. So another way, that you, another comparison you can make with super eruptions in addition to the Deccan traps and the thing that I just talked about, is you can talk about how we are, how our CO2 emissions uh, are in, in, the, in the context of explosive super eruptions. So now we're, we're putting out CO2 at about the rate you would expect for four economy-sized explosive super eruptions. And that goes on every year. So these are things to think about. Um, 
I, uh, I'm not going to, I'm not trying to be, uh, you know, I'm not forecasting that we're going to cause the uh, next extinction from this or anything like that because we're not that stupid. We're not going to go keep doing this. Someday this is going to stop. I know that. Uh, I'm, I'm more afraid, frankly, of, uh, <laughs> of religious warfare at this point in my life <laughs> than I am of this actually, uh, actually happening. Uh, considering at the rate that we're doing this, you know, we would we would have to we would have to actually continue to be to be to put this in context. You, you, we're going to have to continue doing this for for many more hundred years before we're going to actually get to the point where we might cause some kind of extinction, and that, that's just not going to happen. Uh, the uh, the carbon economy is not going to last that long. I don't think. Okay, so concluding remarks. Um, our CO2 emissions, anthropogenic CO2 emissions, totally dwarf volcanic CO2 emissions. And I don't let anybody tell you that they're the same or that volcanic CO2 emissions are larger. <laughs> um, anthropogenic CO2 emissions match those of multiple effusive and explosive super eruptions, and they've, been, they've done so for years. In the case of explosive eruptions that occurred that I just showed you, that means we've been doing explosive eruptions in our CO2 emissions for 65 years. And actually, for the effusive eruptions, it goes back even further in time. <coughs> and they continue to grow. Our, 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 the anthropogenic emissions continue to grow periodically, accelerating relative to volcanic CO2 emissions. And one last point, uh, using volcanic CO2 emission rates as an argument for keeping our CO2 emissions unregulated, which a lot of people will do, uh, that's not a valid. That's not a valid argument. Just on the scientific grounds, that's not valid. Okay, I think I. Uh, what time are we at here now? Seven thirty. Seven thirty. Okay. I, I think we should do some Q and A. I have a lot of other slides that show how I measure, how how we in, in this business measure CO two and a lot of volcano slides. But uh, I think we're just not going to have enough time. Maybe some other time. So let's just open it up to questions and. Uh, and uh, well, actually, I'll just flip through some of these so you can see some of the pictures. Um, there's one. I'll just now just leave them up there for a while. That's an example of uh, collecting gases right there. Yeah. Upon what do you base your faith that the carbon economy is going to end and who are we at? That, that's just faith. I just don't believe people are going to be that stupid that they're going to keep doing this. I, I think people are going to find, find different ways to produce energy. That's, that's what it makes so, I guess I'm optimistic. Yeah. Your one chart you showed a couple of times with our emissions increasing, and on the top of it, you had China and India, yeah. which are adding on what the rest of us have done. <coughs> and I wonder if you could say something about the banking effect in the atmosphere for what we've put out since the start of the Industrial Revolution, and also something about how white people put out something like seven times as much in the way of emissions as non-white people around the world. I believe those are pretty close to the UN numbers for energy consumption at least. Yeah, I don't really know. I, I am not, I, I'm not really able to talk about the last point. That's not something I, I've ever looked into at all. As far as our cumulative total CO2 output, it's about two trillion tons. If we, if we do, if we, you know, if we integrate the area under that curve, then you get about two trillion tons of CO2. Yes. Uh, regarding the uh, Wisconsin glaciation, uh, we, uh, well, there are three main ones there, but anyway, it uh, came and went, and even between here and Highway J at by Custer, there are about uh, five uh, recessional marines. Uh, uh, how do you explain the? Uh, the change in the, uh, the advance and retreat and on the smaller scale, such as between here and Custer. Okay, I'll tell you what, I'll talk to you about that afterwards, but I'd like right now, I'd like to really just answer questions that relate to what, what we've talked about, okay? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure 
understand how you measure or estimate the gas that's coming out because it gets dispersed in the air. How do you, you capture it and extrapolate from that? Okay. This is a spectrometer that we, in, just as an example, hook it onto uh, the outside of a helicopter. This thing is loaded with all kinds of instrumentation, and we simply fly under the plume. Here I am in the helicopter here. There's the, the device. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's a UV spectrometer. And we just simply go out and fly it underneath this plume, and it tells you the, it tells you uh, the burden of the you know, tonnages of CO2 in a slice through this plume. And then we basically just multiply that by the wind speed and that gives us a flex rate. That's basically how it's done. Here's an example of what, this is a digital elevation model here for Mount St. Helens. This is all Mount St. Helens work here, by the way. Uh, you go out and you, what you do is you get under this plume. This plume is going right out here, just like this. This plume is going out here. And you fly figure eights underneath it, back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth, and collect data for it that way. And then we also can now, we can also go up into the plume and measure uh, CO2 and all these other gases as well. We do this all now that way. We don't run around, we don't have to run around in the field with bottles and, you know, <clears throat> stick our skin out into all this anymore. Yeah. Um, a lot of times we hear with um, volcanic eruptions, <clears throat> with all the debris that goes into the atmosphere, it actually can cool the earth That's for right. a, sh a short term. And I think that was the sort of the hypothesis behind the um, asteroid or the meteorite that hit and it cooled the earth and, and hurt the dinosaurs. Whereas the volcanic eruption that you were talking about would have put CO2 into the atmosphere and um, warmed the earth. But do we get a short term cooling and then a long term yes. warming? That's right. That's basically what happens. Um, Here's an eruption. Here are the main gases, SO2, CO2, HCl, HF. Environmentally, uh, the SO2, HCl, and HF as it rains out of the cloud can cause acid rain. But the SO2, when it gets into the stratosphere, can, can be converted over to these aerosols of sulfuric acid. And that will reflect sunlight. And that will cool things. And that happens very fast. And it lasts only for you know a few years, and all these aerosols fall off, and then the CO2 takes over and does its job. So you're right; that's that's basically true. That, that, that's what they think. I, mean, I I don't really know if all these things are on that well understood, but that's the that's the general theory. Yeah. I have a much more simplistic sure. question, but it uh, just boggles my mind when you said worldwide use of cement. Yes. So someone is tracking the cement <coughs> in India and right. China and Afghanistan. Yeah. USGS actually does. Okay, thanks. That was yes. Yeah. yes. Did the fairly recent Icelandic eruption cause cause our recent polar vortex? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I'm afraid that's not that's not the case. No. I, I, was it big enough to do anything to the climate? No, it really wasn't much of a, the, the Icelandic eruption that you're talking about from a few years ago that was so famous. Um, the thing is, the lavas, the, the volcanoes in Iceland erupt underneath big, thick sheets of ice and snow. And so all this problems are having in the atmosphere and the airplane flights and so on and so forth from that and all the debris. It's all just because of big steam explosions that these magnets set off. That's mainly that's mainly what what's going into the air is mainly just a lot of vapor yeah. and and a bunch of you know <coughs> detritus that it can carry, mechanical you know bits and pieces of rock and glass and lava. It's not so much a gas explosion. Yeah. Richard, uh, the, the mechanism of global warming involves sunlight leaving the earth being bounced back to it and warming it, is that correct? Yes. Why wouldn't that same uh, global warming gas cause sunlight coming from the sun to bounce away and therefore not 
Is that real? <laughs> well, I'll, let me just say how it works and then see if it, it helps. Uh, Sunlight comes in. It's the earth. It's the earth. It warms the earth. It doesn't bounce off. It warms the earth. Right. And the and thing, and then the warm earth radiates in the infrared. It doesn't radiate the same energy or the same light really that that came in. The light comes in. It warms the earth. The, warm, the, the warming of the earth leads to infrared radiation, and it's that infrared radiation that's absorbed that can be absorbed by carbon dioxide. That causes the warming. Yes, what causes the warming? It's like it just becomes like a blanket. Yeah. Yes. On that chart you had of the anthropogenic CO2 emissions, yeah. and you correlated the burning of the Amazon forest at that point. Right. Yeah. And the other one, right. the economic collapse yeah. of 2008. Mm -hmm. How do you know that those were causal relationships? Uh, in the case, in the case of the, um, because they're based on the actual measurements, they're, they're they're based on the amounts, they're based on the actual measurements of forest material that was burned, and so they know that during that year there was a huge increase. <coughs> that that's actually that's actually you know based on on measurements of that area. Well, they know that so many acres were burned off in a particular year. And there's a, there, and they know you know how much carbon is stored in those trees, so they can estimate how much CO2 that would produce if they burned it off. Well, yeah. What did they burn off in 2008? Then? Sorry. What did they burn off in 2008? Oh no no, 2008 is just it's a recession. You're not burning as much. You're not generating as much power. Oh okay, you're just putting me on. Okay. <laughs> no, but I wanted to know how they know it was correlated to the economic recession. Because it occurred at exactly that time, it, it, it goes. It, 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 it starts in around 2008, and then it goes right back up. You know, after a couple of years. Yeah. And and they measure during those periods of time. They know how much CO2 is being, uh, how much hydrocarbon stuff and so on is being burned, and it drops off during that period of time. It decreases because there's less economic activity. There's not as much. Uh, Burned even in car fuel, during, you know, in car exhaust during those times. Yes. I have, I have a question about how do we estimate the suboceanic volcanoes at, uh, output? Uh, well, I can wait and tell you when we get home. But yeah. Well, here's the suboceanic volcanoes. Most of the suboceanic volcanoes are along the mid Atlantic Ridge here, or not, I mean the mid oceanic ridge. <coughs> this is this huge mountain chain of volcanoes, and it's, it runs for 40,000 miles. They use the same kind of method. which we can measure also. And that gives us the CO2 rate. What they do in the ocean is they have data for the emission rate of helium-3. The oceanographers really know that. And what the geologists do is they just run around and sample these rocks and measure the CO2 to uh, helium-3 ratio and then use that number. And they get it. And I would just like to point out that, you know, this is one of the things like the um, People like Clymer who say, oh, volcanoes put off far more CO2 than we do, and so on and so forth. And he's always talking about there's all these volcanoes under the ocean that nobody knows about. He knows about them, but I don't know nobody else knows about them. <laughs> and they put out all this stuff. And he says they don't even know how many volcanoes there are. They couldn't even count the volcanoes. How can they tell you how much CO2 comes out of them? Well, we don't count the volcanoes. We just go down and just dredge up these rocks and measure this ratio and use that that helium-3 flux uh, for the whole ocean, and you've got it. Yeah. Yes? Um, what department in the federal government is the uh, geological survey? When did it start compared to when geological survey tackled volcanoes? 
Well, it started long before the geological survey tackled volcanoes. Uh, that didn't actually start until uh, I think in the 1930s sometime. And it's in the Department of Interior. It's in the Department of Interior. But it started long before uh, the volcano stuff started in the 30s. But, but the USGS started long before. Uh, the USGS people were sent out, you know, to uh, measure uh, the, you know, the Grand Canyon and things like that way back in the uh, 1800s. Unfortunately, I think we need to pack it up. Okay, any other questions? I'd be willing to stick around and talk to people.